in terms of the agenda for today, basically, um, Rukia is going to take us through a, um, a presentation that's looking at organizing and absorption. Um, within that, we're going to have a, a breakout session where you folks can speak to each other and talk about your strategies uh, around organizing, about bringing people into the movement. Um, and then we're also going to have like a broader discussion around it too. So I'm excited about that. And I thought I would share a, a little bit of a, a story myself to think about like organizing and absorbing into the movements around events. Um, so one of the other hats that I wear as of recently is something called uh, the secretary of something called the Climate Justice Coalition. It's a relatively new coalition and it's made up of trade unions, it's made up of civil society organizations, community organizations, human rights, public health, um, right to know, anti-corruption sort of work too type organizations. And this kind of came out of, I'm sure many of you were maybe aware of or probably part of the climate strikes last year in September right, where millions of people took to the streets. And as part of organizing that, a number of organizations got really interested in thinking about like, how can they get stuck into the climate change struggle? And so as we were organizing these climate strikes up here in Johannesburg, um, a number of these organizations expressed interest um, and then helped mobilize people through the strikes. And rather than just allowing that interest to, to dissipate afterwards, what we started to do is to meet with those various different organizations and to build up partnerships. And through that um, sort of relationship building, we started to develop this sort of informal group of different organizations that wanted to advance climate justice. And through those meetings, we decided that this was the way that we we're gonna move forward was to form a coalition together, right? And so that's kind of an example of using the contacts that you gain from particular mobilizing point to bring people into the movement and to also bring those that maybe aren't traditional partners into that space too. So that, I thought I would share that little story. And that's the sort of, when we think about organizing and absorption, it is about that sort of process of organizing events, organizing actions, and then how do we bring people in like that into the movement in a more sustained way. And Rukia, who's one of our field organizers for 350 Africa has done really incredible work on this. Um, and so I'm really excited that she, she can come and speak to you all today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rukia, who will run you through the training for today. So thanks, everybody. Welcome. Really looking forward to this discussion. Um, Rukia, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, that was quite the humongous introduction. <laughs> Very generous. I appreciate that. Uh, but uh, so like you said, uh, so my name is Rukia Hermes, uh, and I'm part of the 50 Africa team. Uh, as the field organizer for the Anglophone region. So that's like English speaking regions in Africa, uh, apart from South Africa. Uh, and my job is to work alongside different groups in the Anglophone region and just help them um, polish up the campaigns and just raise their voices in terms of the movements that they're running, um, specifically around uh, fighting fossil fuel uh, infrastructure, as well as promoting the renewable energy narrative across the regions as well. Um, so just to uh, welcome you all, thank you so much for making the time to show up for this uh, session. Um, uh, despite everything that's happening, um, it's awesome to see every, like human, like youths coming through to just um, share and learn from each other. Uh, so this, for this session, just to begin with, uh, I would just ask everyone to just put um, if you're joining now, just tell us your name and your location. Uh, if you have joined earlier, you already did that. Just share um, one, if you have attended a climate rally or event, um, two, if you've organized, and one and two, if you've done both. So I'll just take a, just, let's just take one minute to put that on the chat. That's okay. Um, So I'll show by example, I'll say Kenya, Kenya, one, then two. Awesome. Great. 
great. Thank you guys for sharing. Awesome. Perfect. So this is amazing. So um, the first like very general or um, what's the, the basic thing about uh, organizing is building people power uh, and planning. Um, like any event, because I'm seeing a lot of people have organized and some have also actually attended or done both, which is really impressive. Uh, so that means you have planned for an event and you have ensured that people actually attend that event. Uh, so for this session, we'll be speaking around how do we build on that people power? Uh, if we go 10 people this time, how do we get 20 more people to support our movement? Um, and how, like, how do we just make our movement grow bigger and better over the years? So I'll share my screen for a second, um, just to help out with the session. One second. Um, so just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Uh, cool. Alex, can you see my screen? Awesome. Thank you. So, uh, like I said earlier, uh, with in any organizing, we need to start planning, and we always like a plan is always the first <laughs> initial step. Uh, it's just like organizing a birthday party, and you have to plan who you're going to invite, why, when, and that more. Uh, so, when we come to like campaigns and organizing campaigns, you need to think around um, planning uh, long term. So, for example, if you're running a renewable energy campaign, you don't just want to do like one event and then stop there. You want to make it consistent and have a plan over a longer period of time. So this will build on your strategy and make everything like flow easily. And even the audience that you're uh, participating with would have an idea of what's next for the campaign that they're supporting. Um, so once you plan, you need to now recruit guys to come and attend that event or build on that campaign uh, so this will be around, so we call that recruitment. Uh, it's as simple as recruiting guys <laughs> in the army. Um, so the most important aspect of, this is just like very important as well in terms of a campaign because people power is the heart of that campaign as well. So you can recruit in many different ways and I won't go deep into it because I know we're going to touch this more onto this when we do the breakout session. Um, but just like, paying attention to every single opportunity that you have to make sure that you recruit people from social media or you're in a meeting and you're like, guys, I have this event that's coming up, please show up. Or just speaking to a friend and telling them to share in, a, in, a, in their setting or meeting that they're attending. That's an easy way to build people power. Um, then in terms of recruits, as environmentalists, we have a habit where we, we stick to what we know or who, the people we know. Uh, something we call preaching to the converted. Uh, so we'll send emails or invites to the same, same people that we send. So for example, um, I'm in a group called Environmental 254. It's a Kenyan group around people working around environment. And if there's an event, I'll share on that group and say, hey guys, I'm having this event, come show up. But what if I shared that in the group where maybe it's around artwork and artists and asking them to come through and also support the movement. So it's always helpful to find new ways to just get recruitment or recruit people to come and join your event. So the message that you're sharing, the, clim the message around climate justice, the environmental conservation goes far and wide, the people who already know about the environment and are fighting for it. Um, then obviously once you've recruited guys, you've done the planning and people are sure that you event how are you gonna retain those people um, and keep them updated of the event, uh, whether before that event and even after? So looking around how to have just regular meetings. So the one thing that's worked with me so far is having a WhatsApp group. Um, so once I'm inviting them, I'm telling them, please, could you please join my WhatsApp group? And there you would, re would kind of speak to them around any changes that might come up in the in your event. So sometimes things change. Uh, you may decide you did your event at nine, uh, two months ago, and then maybe you don't get a permit and it has to change to, to maybe 
10 p.m. or I mean 10 a.m. Sorry, and that you need to update people on that and a, a good space to update and make sure that you don't lose the people those people that thought it's gonna happen earlier. Um, just make sure you share like having spaces like the WhatsApp group and more. Um, then just looking into I'm gonna dive back into um, just involvement and engagement. So in any for organizers there are several parts to them. There's the there's the lead group. Um, so the people who are at the center of that campaign. Uh, for example, with CJC, uh, Alex will be at the center of that campaign for the work that they do around in CJC. So when then we move up to owning. So these are people who come in and help them, whether with funding and support and more, and just want to support and grow that movement or campaign. Um, then you have guys who are contributors. So they're either volunteers, content creators. So maybe in your WhatsApp group, there's someone who helps you with social media so, or someone who shares your content often um, or even spread the word about you to partners and more. They'll fall around contribution and more. And then there's this, those people who called endorsers. Um, so I think you've seen it on LinkedIn when someone says, could you endorse uh, my skill on LinkedIn? Uh, it's a similar way in, in a movement or campaign. So maybe on Facebook, you might share a petition. So the person who comes in and just like signs on the petition because they just saw it and they're like, huh, I like to support this. That will be an endorser in your movement. And then there's be those people who follow you. So they subscribe to your email list. Um, they follow you on Twitter to just keep track of what you guys are doing, but doesn't do any more than that. And then there's the observers. Um, they'll just be, huh, so what are they doing today? Or it passes through them when there's like a boosting via social media. Um, and that helps them just know, oh, so this campaign, CJC are doing this and that. Um, so this, why I'm bringing the engagement period, pyramid now is uh, speaking, uh, this would just be a good conversation to have in terms of just how you retain your uh, organizers as well as how do you do absorption later on? Because each level of the pyramid requires a whole different, um, uh, what is the word, uh, commitment or um, uh, kind of care to it. So for example, people, if you have volunteers or in your WhatsApp group, there's that personal WhatsApp, there's that central WhatsApp group where people who are central in that campaign are working around strategizing, building ideas, how to plan. You need, those people have updates of your event every single day or have updates about your campaign every single day. But how do we bring people who are observers or followers to really come closer to being even leaders or owners of that campaign as well. And that's what movement, movement building is about. It's about not only just speaking to that small circle that we have, but making sure the wider circle comes really close to us and really owns that movement as if it's their own. Um, so I'll stop there and maybe we'll, uh, I'll suggest if we can go on a record group and discuss a few things together and even get to know each other in this space. Um, so these are the questions we're gonna be discussing and uh, we'll give a second for the technical team to help us with that. But so when we go to the breakout groups, we'll be speaking around. So what, when you think about a climate rally or event, um, what made you attend that event in the first place? Um, so that would be entailing in terms of did they advertise properly or were you passionate about that that campaign or that call to action? Were they consistent in reaching out to you, stuff around that kind of stuff? Um, and then obviously with the COVID-19 situation, what are you seeing out there in terms of people, how are people adopting in terms of organizing and building events? Like what's new? Like what are the new ways of organizing right now in this period and space? Uh, and then uh, the last question will be around uh, using what you have to build people power. So if from like right now I'm in the house, what can I do to make sure like I can build people power without using too much resource, uh, but like, ensuring that I'm building a movement somehow. Um, hopefully those questions are clear, but I will share them on, again on the chat. Um, yeah, so I hope that was um, helpful somehow. Thanks, Rikia. 
And maybe just to, to add a little bit, as we break out into those little groups, part of what we want to do as well is get you folks to, to speak to each other a little bit and get to know each other. We don't want it to just be us uh, as the facilitators and trainers speaking. So also introduce yourselves um, in, the, in those little breakout groups too. Are there any questions before we maybe dive in there? Or maybe we should just go straight to it. Alrighty, Chris, you're the man with the magic behind the scene. Can you uh, can you do whatever voodoo you do, please? Yeah, and then when you discuss, just pick someone to report back. Yeah, someone to lead your session. Ready. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I think, um, Rukia, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so yeah, so um, we'd just like to hear from you all. Um, thank you for just taking the time to be on the breakout groups and discussing with each other. So maybe you pick someone from your team to present. So be for the next and my daughter. Uh, sorry. So for the next ten minutes, could we um, present back to each other and just share what we spoke around in each other's groups? Um, just put us down this chat if you wanna go ahead. Yes, Gabriel. Um, cool. Um, so we had a bit of a just a get to know each other for the first two minutes. Um, because I think it's important before you start discussing things to get to know the people in your space. Um, and then we went straight into the questions. Question one being, um, what makes, what made you attend the rallies and events? Um, and, you know, we went straight off with personal investment. Um, you saw what that event hosted or had in place for yourself. Um, someone mentioned that they felt overwhelmed um, regarding the, the circumstance that the event was protesting and an urge to stand against the injustice toward people affected, um, as well as that anxiety and that existential fear, um, you know, at first, um, you know, and then learning from that and going to those events, learning, um, you know, the intersectionality that, that sits within certain events and then wanting to go again and again and bring more people, um, as well as the very effective old school method of word of mouth um, friends and colleagues, you know, telling each other and sharing and spreading the news. So that was definitely, you know, what, you know, made us, you know, respectively, you know, join these movements. Um, and then regarding ways that people are adapting during COVID-19 um, and in the future. Um, so there were immediately um, I brought up the term Zoom webinars and calls because that's everyone's favorite trigger words. Um, and then, you know, the digital space and the online events being successful, you know, they've been successful, but it would be a miss to overlook the fact that people do suffer from resource, um, from not having resources and data and, you know, network penetration and accessibility. Um, so while there is that space of, you know, the online space and online dominion, we need to address that fact. Um, and then, the last question, which we kind of had answered, but you know, time kind of ran out, but we did get a good answer. Um, what ways are you, you know, building people power? Um, and then, you know, discussing a big way right now was not necessarily the individual kind of, you know, actively doing things, but building long-term, you know, plans for organization, you know, adapting to the digital, we are adapting to the digital space, but there is a big digital divide. Um, you know, possibly, you know, setting up hotspots in certain areas so that people can connect to them, um, you know, and then in the future, um, you know, different campaigns that run like that. Um, and then lastly, we had Les mentioned, um, you know, socio-environment, um, currently collective movement and different youth organizations um, under collective movement are trying to build the kind of youth socio-environmental coalition to kind of build that unity and, you know, people power. So I really like that idea a lot. Um, that's essentially our group's feedback. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. 
Um, okay, so for the first question, okay, for, we just went in straight to the questions and then we did the introductions and getting to know each other um, at the end because we had network issues. So the first question was, what makes you attend a climate rally or event? Um, the answers were like, if you get invited to it and you see relevance to you personally and the community that you stay in, um, as the rallies or events will help you find innovative methods that will help combat um, environmental issue, such as like sand mining in Eklobe, one of our group members are from um, Bondoland, if I'm not mistaken. And then it was also discussed that you gain more knowledge about the climate change if you don't have like much knowledge about what is climate change and how it affects you. And if it's part of your job description to spread the word, um, therefore rallies and events are what will help you. Um, so the second question is, in what ways are people adapting to organizing um, during COVID-19? So for everyone, it was technology. So like we're moving, like we're using like, you know, social media to communicate. So it was just that. And how do you, how do you use what you have when organizing? Um, okay, so for, for us, it was the, it's technical resources, um, resources that we're using currently, such as emails to communicate, and then we have um, Zoom meetings and webinars. And yeah, that we need to make do with what we have as like we have limited resources with, um, during the lockdown. But then if you don't have any resources, you can also opt for sponsorships to help you if you are lacking any resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, Nikwazi? Hi, everyone. Um, so basically, um, we, we were at room five. Um, for I'll just get straight to the point. For question one, um, we all shared uh, on the reason why we attend um, climate change rallies or events. Um, first and foremost, it was passion for, for all of us. And um, just being around people who have the same passion as you, who are passionate ab about the environment just as you are. And also to just um, get a hang on what, what other people are doing in terms of adaptation and, and mitigation, just to get something that we can take back home and apply it. And then the second question, um, obviously with COVID-19, online platforms are the way to go. Um, besides it being the only way that, that we can have meetings, um, it's, it's also reducing our, our carbon footprint because I, I find that sometimes as, environment, as environmentalists, we contradict ourselves. We're always talking about carbon footprint, um, reducing, yet we're always traveling back and forth to have these meetings, to have these rallies. So I think Online platforms are the way to go. Like right now, as, as we are having this summit, we are not using any, any cars to travel uh, back and forth to meet each other. We're not taking any planes. Um, so right now, all of us here, we are doing our own bits. And then for the third question, um, in terms of organizing, during this time, I know it's very hard for everyone. So um, it all goes back to um, networking. All the people that we meet um, during the rallies um, and stuff. So it all it, it's, it goes back to networking um, and just finding people um, with a similar vision when it comes to climate change. People who want to see change just um, as much as you do. So in terms of organizing, um, sometimes it's much easier. I mean, with our country, you have to know people who know people in order to, to get things done. Um, so yeah, that was wrong. Thank you, Nokwazi. And I'm seeing like a lot of plus pluses from everyone, from uh, for Grabiera, Vanessa and Nokwazi, in terms of what you've shared. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll pass it over to Sai. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so of of my group of four, only two of us have attended um, rallies. And basically what came out of the first question, which we actually put a lot of um, discussion into, was that um, passion was very important 
because we have to be passionate enough to participate. Um, joining campaigns to share experiences with other people, meet other young like-minded people and learn from them about what they are doing in their communities. And also um, the recruiters ensured the safety and that the participants were prepared for anything. Um, the messages expressed by the organizations, organize, oh, excuse me, <laughs> The organizers um, correlated with the personal views of the participants. Um, the events were well planned and they even had emergency kits. Um, they ensured that there was no panic or disorder and the group updated, gave constant updates on the events, the campaign, the location and the conduct that the participants should follow. Um, also, another factor is that uh, a larger group of people motivates more people to participate. And the recruitment team must have powerful speakers who also consider both the attendees' interests as well as their own. Um, we also asked um, how were you informed about this? And one of the answers were that the participant was invited by a religious leader. And I think that just speaks to the uh, importance of religious leaders and community leaders in our society. And to the second uh, question of how we are adapting in terms of protests due to the virus, um, we spoke about the Collins Corsa protest that happened in, well, it wasn't necessarily a protest, but um, in Cape Town, how the people um, left messages of solidarity outside the parliament and posters and pictures without actually having a large group of people there. So I think that minimized the contact and that was a, a good idea as well. Um, I think it's unanimous when we speak about social media and online protests, as well as courses and summits like this one and um, advertisements on social media. So, yeah. And to the third question, we didn't really have enough time to answer that. And I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone who is in my group. So, um, yeah. Thank you for the space. Thank you, Sai. Uh, and I understand um, when we're speaking about organizing, like it gets very overwhelming because with organizing, it's more of actions and not just speaking. So there's so much to discuss and learn together. Um, so it's totally understandable if you didn't have enough time, but we're going to get to talk more together moving forward. Uh, I'm going to welcome uh, Taji next. Hi, everyone. So I was in room two. And the first question, what makes you attend a climate rally or event? Um, we had answers such as the event or rally aligns with your belief, beliefs. The event has a clear aim and isn't like vague and just kind of, um, yeah, it needs to have focus. And then the organizers, it's great. Um, if they give details beforehand and a clear plan of action, what is the purpose of the event? And um, another great answer was that the event addresses issues that are close to home and not just like something that's very general um, that's happening on the other side of the world, even though everything is interconnected, but it does help when one understands um, when the issue is kind of local. And then the second question was, in what ways are people adapting to organizing during COVID-19? Um, as many other people have said so far, social media, um, online kind of events, and then in-person in events as well, in small groups with social distancing and other precautions um, have been happening as well. And, um, one person in our group, I think it was Tammy, said that um, one positive of 
the COVID-19 kind of situation in terms of events is that the reach has been increased. Um, people from different countries can even attend um, the same event. Um, and then um, Rukia, who was in our group, you were lucky to have Rukia, and she said that even after COVID-19, we can still use social media um, and learn from this experience and use it to organize events in the future. And then for the last question, we didn't have time to get to it. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Tadi, for sharing. Uh, and thank you, Lisa. And yeah, thank you for joining as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys for sharing back and uh, just a couple of run through from the themes. Uh, a lot of theme around passion and and planning and that's exactly what we were speaking about earlier um at anyone would feel safer to attend an event if there's planning and planning doesn't just help um just the people who are attending but also the organizer just have some peace of mind uh in terms of what's coming up and how that would look like um so thank you guys it's really useful uh, and i hope we can take it forward so i'll run through quickly uh, due to time just on the second part of the presentation which is around uh, absorption uh, content creation and safety uh, I'll share my screen one last time um, so like we spoke earlier absorption is a very interesting uh, uh, conundrum because absorption doesn't just happen uh, before um, like after an event that you're now picking people up and bringing them into your movement but literally you need to start this the moment you start thinking about a movement or uh, just starting a movement and because when whenever you're retaining people or inviting people that's you do that's you doing the initial that's doing the initial step of uh, uh, of uh, absorbing people and after the event, then now you can actually uh, bring those people and who are not on your WhatsApp group and make them even come closer to you. So like I said earlier, in terms of the, the ladder of engagement or the pyramid of engagement, sorry. So like bringing those people who are viewers on Facebook and having them come back to your WhatsApp group. So this could be after your event, you share like a WhatsApp a link and tell people, hey, thank you for joining our event. Uh, please join our WhatsApp group to get to know more about our event. Or better yet, you can have um, a sign up link where people sign up to your event and you can get emails and phone numbers of those people. And in future, use those contacts that you've gotten to push that campaign forward and send them email blasts or just uh, communication in terms of, oh, this is how far we are. Uh, if by joining this our event, you helped us get to this uh, section with our petition. And that's just basics in terms of uh, absorption. And we'll t I'll let you guys speak more on it together and just discuss it more. And I won't dive that much to it. Um, also, there's like a planning template in terms of absorption, which obviously we'll share after the, the presentation and webinar, uh, once the webinar has ended. Then there's the aspect of cont uh, content production or creation. Most times we do an event um, and then we go and we forget about it. Like uh, we don't think about people who want to like read through and hear more from us. So doing blogs, uh, writing up news articles, doing op-eds on, on the newspaper brings a whole different audience to your campaign and also makes people be able to keep track of that campaign and helps you just maintain that absorption kind of thing you're trying to do. So if I'm, looking at the newspaper and I wasn't present at the event, but I saw a newspaper article talking about an event, maybe Taji uh, did, and I'm like, huh, I'm actually passionate about this work. I wish I knew about this. And in that news article or blog, there's a link to your website for that movement that you're running or that campaign, or there's a phone number that someone can reach out to you. Content production is a good way to bring those people in um, to your space. Uh, also, content production can be used to attract people to your event. So producing a video asking guys to join an event or uh, showcasing uh, pictures of uh, like of impacts of a campaign you're running. So for example, maybe you're talking around water pollution or access to water uh, in, a, in an area and you take pictures of guys walking around, like taking water from 
like rivers and more and not having and having maybe dry taps without water coming through that could inspire someone to join your campaign and come through to you um then finally i'm going to run through just left in organizing um so this is last on my slide but not the last thing you should consider when you're organizing um safety is it's a very interesting uh, concept and i had uh from the people presented on their groups uh gabriela vanessa and okwazi sai and taji that when someone assures you safety when you attend their rally or event you uh, you feel more comfortable to show up and attend and help as well um and a few tips and tricks that we use during rallies and i'm sure most of you have used as well uh, is the body system so this is when um you uh and your friend like keep each other in check and you know where your friend is going uh, so you're not just walking alone in a protest but you have a friend who can check up on you in case they don't find you throughout the rally uh there's the aspect of t-shirts most people think branding is only for um aesthetics but it also ident helps you identify intruders in a protest um so for example if you shared um t-shirts with your close people under the uh close participants for that group if someone comes into the protest and is not wearing a t-shirt you'd be more on guard to just be careful who that person is so they don't like uh uh mess up with anything also if someone like that does vandalism in in a space um they can't say those guys who uh, organize that uh, rally or event are the ones responsible for that vandalism and more um then there's someone called the peacekeeper who for example if you're doing a a rally and you're reaching out to people and you're going to reach out to the police or maybe a politician and you need to speak because everyone else is hyped up on the side you need one person who will be the one who's be speaking to the petition the, uh, the politician or the one who will be delivering the petition so he's that person he or she would be uh that would be his or his or her personal mandate to do that so it helps everyone else continue doing crazy things but one person who's focused and uh, more calm so i won't get too much into it uh but i'd like to open up the space for everyone else and just have a discussion around uh what are the ways do you guys stay safe uh and what are the challenges do you guys have in terms of organizing so for just a couple of maybe 5 minutes uh we can have a discussion on that um kuli kani i see your hand is raised thank, thank you very much i just want to share just one thing i'm not sure how really practical it is though is that when you are organizing for instance a strike or a march uh, it's better to know everyone or to know who came with who and i'm saying that because i have a very bad experience in a march where you think that we are all for the same thing but then the people that you are with are actually there just to to distract you um it's either they would want to argue with you or they would just beat you up straight you know and then you will you, you will not see who is that who is that person who, who beat you up or some people would just um throw stones at um at, at you but within within the protest within within the the crowd and that has happened uh, it it is happening both like everywhere everywhere even in international events in the in, in the UN it has happened so uh, so i just wanted to to share that it is very very much important to know who is there or at least you know who came with who but then in a in a bigger in a bigger crowd i'm not really sure how that is practical but it's very important just wanted to to share that thanks Lee. thank you as a facilitator i'm just going to make a note we recognize it's 5 o'clock but if folks are okay we'll just go a little bit over if you need to go It's totally fine because we said for the hour, but we'll just go over a little bit more. So thanks, Rukia. Back to you. Thank you, Alex, for that reminder. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll pass it over to Gabriel, and thank you, Kuli, for sharing. Thank you. Um, so um, I think another thing that really kept me, or gave me a sense of like safety and, and precaution, was knowing that, you know, there are people who are who went through training. um i forgot what they called um uh i forget what they called you 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 do they wear the vests and they walk around with the first aid as well forget the name for the life of me um 
but yeah, just knowing marshals. that there's like marshals. Thank you. Um, you know, just knowing that there are marshals, you know, and make the marshals identified. Um, you know, and and also when you establish that peacekeeper, ensure that you know the crowd understands who that person is. Um, you know, and then lastly, ensure that when you are that peacekeeper, you know, you don't get involved with the commotion and you know all of a sudden you lose track of your papers and you know things like that and your permits and stuff um you know that way you can ensure that all the guys girls and non-binary and non-binary pals you know are calm and feel you know safe in that space so yeah that's just my five cents on it thank you thank you say ah uh, sorry <laughs> thank you Gabriel, for sharing um yeah, I'll welcome uh, Hesper and not Nicholas. Yeah, I just wanted to add something to what Gabriel said. Um, what we did last year for one of the climate strikes, I can't comment on how um, on how effective it was, but from what I gathered, it was pretty good. Is that because we were encouraging a lot of school kids to come, we were encouraging their parents and their teachers to come along and um, act as peacekeepers and marshals. Um, obviously, because we couldn't be like finding people who have been trained in this just everywhere for the amount that we needed and one of the things that we did to facilitate that and make sure that they could do their job as best as possible is that we hosted a martial training um a few days before the protest um and this was a very effective system in that you can ask people who not only just want to come to the protest but who would be willing to do this kind of thing given a quick run through of what's going on what the root is of the protest what the numbers are going to be like what kind of things they are and aren't allowed to do and it can be a really really effective way of finding people who can be keeping the peace and um, keeping the civility um without having to like go pay some people from a company who do this as uh, for a lifetime or something like that Thank you, Nicholas. That's 100%. Uh, that's a very, very good point. Um, yeah, uh, I'll pass it over to Les. Yeah, on another point of safety as well. Um, the Also just making sure that you have all your information in check and you know your legal rights as well. Um, we found at one of our climate protests in Pretoria last year um, in September that as a marshal, you do sort of have to con like control everyone. If someone does something, you are sort of held liable. Um, so like we did have a, a situation where the police did come, even though they were like the police did come, even though the Metro Police was supposed to be there and they didn't. And they were like, where's your permit? Where's this and this and this? And while we did have our legal rights and we had everything, the police still will be very on your case if you don't have it, all the information. So you need to make sure you know all your legal rights as a protest and as a marshaller and, um, and just an organizer in general. So you know that like you don't, you won't get into trouble or they, you know, if there are any corrupt police, they don't take advantage of the system um, and to make sure you protect yourself. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I love the points that are coming through from everyone. Uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Alex uh, to just uh, take it forward. Yeah, just thinking about time, being time conscious, and also maybe adding to that point, um, obviously we're facing COVID-19 regulations here in South Africa, and so the right to protest is in a very much a uncertain and uh, in a space of limbo. And so with some of the, the work that we've been doing to try organize protest, um, one really valuable organization to reach out to is Right to Protest. Um, and they have lawyers there that can assist you with understanding what are your legal rights, um, especially with this uh, shifting lockdown regulations. I think it could be really tricky. So we'll maybe add those into the links to share with you too, so that you can reach out to them. Um, because yeah, as we know, police brutality um, is is a real uh, is a significant reality in South Africa, and so having your right to protest there is really important. Um, so I think we're kind of moving towards the end here. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I think a big thank you to Rikia for leading us through that, and a big thank you to you all for those really valuable insights. I think the the collective wisdom in this young room is really impressive. So thank you so much, everybody. 
Um, moving forward to Friday, um, one of the, we want to go deeper into these questions around what is your experience as organizing? What are some of the challenges that you faced? How do you think about those challenges and organize better and build stronger and really bring more people into this movement? So hopefully this was a really good starting point to start really diving into that. Um, what I'm gonna ask you folks to do now is just like a closing exercise is uh, feel free to just maybe type in in the chat like one lesson that you learned, keep it relative short, a word or two words. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll share a story because as we're moving to you know more online action, I think what we can't lose is the disruptive nature that protest is often supposed to have. Right? So how do we disrupt it digitally? And there was that great example where K-pop fans bought out a Trump rally and sold out all the tickets so that fewer and fewer people came. So how can we be disruptive like that? Um, yesterday, when Guede Montache was having a big speech on sustainable infrastructure development uh, organized by the president, one of the things that I did was every time he would talk about clean coal or, or fossil gas, I would be in the, the chat where everybody could see who was watching it and like putting links to why there's no such thing as clean coal and so on. So how can you disrupt these narratives? How can we get in there and not lose all the power that we're lo losing from not being able to be physically together? So thanks for everybody sharing those um, points in there. Um, organizing and safety seems to be a big part of, of what folks are sharing. Um, so lots of important there. Um, safety tips, absorption. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll send, definitely try send more invites when those things happen. It was kind of on the short notice. Um, and yeah, can we disrupt those? And even when like the Minister of Environmental Affairs invites you to join one of her discussions, like she's a somewhat friendly politician, but how can we hold her feet to the fire? Alrighty, and feel free as you start to sign off because we're kind of coming to the end now to, to jump off um, jump off the video, maybe say a little goodbye because we're kind of winding things down. So thank you so much again, everybody. Uh, a really good discussion and we'll see you Friday for the next one. Thank you.